to Boston with his family, and he's now visiting his daughter at Northeastern. And we're just really fortunate to have you here, and we look forward to hearing about your work. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, thank you. Um, it's also a pleasure to be here, and I'm very fortunate to be here because I know today I'm also going to learn a lot, you know, from being here and sharing. I'm sure that's what this is all about. It's about all sharing. <clears throat> because like I always say, you know, um, this is the boat, and we are in this boat together. We have to make, to make choices whether we want it to sail safely and land us where we want to go or whether it's going to sink. And uh, that's why um, this uh, path that we choose for ourselves, those of us who are involved in this work, um, is the path to advance the cause of humanity. Um, it doesn't matter where you are. You know, whether you are in the place called Liberia, or you are in the U.S., or you are in the place in South America, in Guatemala, or in Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, or Sri Lanka, we all have to find a way to do something for where all of us are on this planet. And so there are some issues about that, but I am grateful that you were able to ask me to come and share and to be able to also think and listen along with you. I'm sure there are some ideas where at the end of the day we'll all be clear where we want to be able to go. Um, so, um, most of you, I'm sure, uh, are aware of Liberia, um, the history about it, where it is. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. This looks like something here in the U.S., is it not? Except for this. You know, and so I always try to make people understand what it is. So, but this is Africa. I'm, I'm sorry. So, this is where we are. You know, and if you look at um, Africa, um, I'm sure I didn't put that map, but this is what Liberia looks like. And if you see it, you see all of this green. This is uh, uh, in West Africa. And the whole of Northwest Africa, those of you who have an idea about the geography and other stuff, this is the greenest area you can ever find in that whole region. And this is where the greenest areas are. And because Liberia contains one of the last remnants of the tropical rainforest in that area called the Upper Guinea Forest, we currently have like 43% of that. And so part of our work has really been trying to find a way to protect, you know, both the forest and the people who live in that forest. So it's been a huge menace to protect the forest and protect the people and defend them. But I wanted to go back in history, you know, like I try to refer you to the flag, so you have an idea how all of this started off from, right? So um, back in the 1800s, I'm sure you know about this, so I'll go very fast. Liberia was funded by the Americans. Three slaves who left the shoes and went back to Africa. And they had two basic missions, Christianize and civilize. Of course, that's a long story. Today is not a day to have that conversation about that. But there are interesting things about it. Not just the flag, but even the ship that they went on is called Elizabeth the Mayflower. Doesn't that sound interesting? <laughs> But of course, they went in an area where there was already some issues, and when they landed, you know, and uh, you know, they had to negotiate treaty with the, with the natives. Of course, it was at the gunboat that was the U.S. federal gunboat that was there that forced uh, the natives to be able to negotiate and give a treaty to give them place to settle. But during that period, there was series of conflict over land. So even the current land grabbing started as far back as the foundation of to Liberia, so you can see what it is. And given all of these issues, which were unsettled over a period of time, if you can see it, that then led to a coup. It was the first time where the indigenous people, they had a coup, a master side in San Mateo, a military coup, took over, overthrew the government, assassinated 13 government officials, lost the president. 
And you would think that's the end of the story. And then, in 1989-1998, there was a war. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. He's our former leader, he's Charles Taylor. He's now inducted, the war criminal, and, you know, been inducted and convicted in prison. But the war was terrible. It allowed for a lot of flight back and forth. And, of course, this is another history we made. Most of you, in fact, it's been here currently. Um, many people are aware. Um, the first time a female was democratically elected as a president in Liberia, and in Africa, in fact. Um, and there was a lot of hope, you know, for a country, you know, if you went through my history of, you know, ethnic going in, settling, enacting conflict. Terrible military coup, we've been slaughtered, war, and some of the worst atrocities you can imagine that happened that you don't want to even describe. You know, I saw some of that war, and it was a terrible war. You know, people being slaughtered, children being used as child soldiers, women being butchered, pregnant women, fetus taken out, and play like football. It was, you can describe that war. So there was hope when we had uh, a president elected as a female and a grandmother, and we saw the country was going forward. Um, so it was a time I had, uh, you know, come back, I had come to the U.S. before that time, attended law school. I was a graduate of student law school, and so I decided to go back home, you know, to lend my support, you know, uh, to the country. And, uh, but, uh, just before that time I went back, um, there were some young people, um, we're all classmates. Most time I'm sure a lot of environmental movements is going to start off in, in schools, right? So these were my classmates and study mates, and we got together and we decided that the idea to set up Green Africa. And we made a commitment to ready to fight for both the planet and the people who live on the planet. And so those early days, there were a lot of issues we were involved with. But uh, we wanted to make sure that our work was cast in what the constitution was. We wanted a legal basis for our work. And so in the Librarian Constitution of 1986, um, it talks about how the country, you know, shall ensure the maximum peaceful participation of all Liberians in decisions concerning the economy and natural resources. And we felt that was an important mandate to uphold as a vision for our institution. And one of the first work I did, and I always joke about this, you know, just coming out of law school, you know, my first year of work out of law school was to help my colleague to do uh, draft an environmental law. It was crazy. You know, a young law school graduate um, from the law school that has never taught environmental law. In fact, I started teaching the first course a year ago. Then, unfortunately, I had to flee the country. But um, I started reading and trying to figure out what it is. But in the end, we got there. We had the act drafted, and now we have an EPA. But beyond just doing this, I was also involved in some campaign and advocacy, you know. I'm trying to, some campaign and advocacy. So there are issues concerning toxic waste, um, issues concerning uh, um, um, protecting this, this type of national park. Um, we're involved in training judges and training lawyers. Um, we're involved in some local cases. Um, there was an attempt, um, government tried to sell uh, some stockpile of iron ore. We tried to stop it. We had our first land grabbing case. You see, put up by the news spot there, where the company is Librarian Agricultural Company. It's a big uh, subsidiary of a company called Sofin. Um, we're able to take almost about 600,000 acres of land. We had to find a way to stop that. Um, we went to court. Um, if you see here, so here is the Sapo National Park, um, where there were miners. We found a way to get those miners out. Oh, this is the land grab case I told you about. This is way back in 2004 and five. You know, and land grabbing was something that was not very much on the radar. And was just thinking about it. Even for us, we were like, well, you know, let's protect them. We didn't think it was going to be this big global movement coming out to address those issues. You know, and this was like, our, we call this a class of 93. Year 93, indigenous people were arrested and put, on, put behind this bar. I mean, in, I think, a seven by eight room. It is, if, you, if you see here, they couldn't even fit in the room. In the background is a room there, they couldn't fit, so they had to spread outside in this barbed wire. We had to be able to protect them. That was 2005, and we have not seen the issues yet. And of course, beyond this land grabbing, we're also involved in cases concerning something that you all know here. You know, Brixton Firestone is an American icon. 
and we're involved in looking at human rights issues and uh, environmental issues around that. This is uh, my first visit um, to the operation of Brickstone. By then, they were using the river system and they were just dumping waste into the river. You know, and the locals, most of them left their kettles dying and no water or whatsoever. You know, it was serious. And then there were child labor issues as well. And this formed part of the case. Those who are lawyers here, it's good to check on Sumo versus Firestone. This is a case I was involved in many years ago. It's an important case because I remember uh, most of you who have followed the Alien Circling Act, some of the issues about whether corporations, you know, are liable on international law for violence in the human rights environment is a big, a big issue. Many linked towards the case from Nigeria, Kubel. But this was the case in the Lering Cycle with George Postman, who made that decision that yes, they are liable. But we lost the case because they said the plaintiffs, which were the escape, you know, um, the activities did not amount to a violation of international law. And so my friend Terry always say, you know, um, we won the war and lost the battle. You know, so this was an important piece of stuff. So now, if you think that all of what I'll say, you know, you're like, wow, these people have done a lot of work, and, you know, and they're moving. You haven't seen anything yet, right? You haven't seen anything yet. And I'm saying this because sometimes I always tell young people and my students, you know, that this is not a job, you know, to become an activist. It's not a job. It's a passion. It's almost like a religion. It has to come from in you. You have to believe in it. And you can give up disappointment, frustration. You know, when you are confused, you know, like, what's going on now in the U.S.? You know, most of my friends who are in the progressive movement, like, oh, my God. The moment I'm, I'm getting invited to a home, and I'm saying, now, you want to have a drink? Yes. Oh, Afra, what a time you came to our country. What a time have you come to this country? I mean, I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry. I want to apologize. I'm like, don't apologize. These are learning movements for an activist. Important learning movement. Important learning movement. It's important for you to have this opportunity to learn, to understand what it is. But also, these are also important movement for organizing, for mobilizing, for building the team. These are important movement for a reawakening, for a new vision of advancing our cause. But it is the time to go and reap and to grow and to allow for growth and to bring new ideas and new innovation. That's what the challenges are for. So somehow you see this thing, like, oh. so you know, and we got to this point at a time in Liberia when we know we were fighting the brickstones and the Liberian agriculture companies and you know the grabbing of iron ore. We're like, oh, what well, is what? And then we got to this point. So this is what our forest looked like. And this is what started happening to it. You can see. And sometimes, you know, I always see this. It's just, it's just a forest. You know, someone fly over this or they do satellite images. Now, it's just forest. You know, it's, it's trees and whatsoever. But no one understands what this really is. You know, I have met with indigenous people who tell me, this is home. This is our home. This is our university. This is our pharmacy. This is our drugstore. This is our school. This is our research laboratory. This is everything that makes us. This is our history. It's our culture, our value, our belief system. Everything is in it. This is what makes us. This is who we are. And people forget what that word it is. It's like all trees. Of course, in terms of the science, we don't understand what it is. This is also huge stock of carbon that nature is just reserving to make sure that there's stability going on around us. Nobody can to see what that really is. And then you have this going on. Right. So it's an issue. And the reason why, you know, I'll show you the map before. I'll show you this map before of Northwest Africa. If you see this here, all of year, all of year is all desert, and year is just grassland, and just where the small forest is, right? 
So imagine how important this peace, this forest is. It's the lungs. That's what gives a lot of the oxygen in the entire region. That's why it's so important. That's why we have to move out of We've got to find a way to protect it. But then, you know what's going on around the world? You know, we need food, we need fiber, we need to survive, we want to live a good life. You know, but there are things that we all need, not just in Liberia, but around the whole world. So the global trend for resources is, is driving this process. It's driving what we see is going on here. So now we take it for granted. You know, if you want, you know, you sit in the car and the tire is on there, or you walk in the store, you buy a bottle of soap. You know, uh, you know, you want to sit on the good furniture, or you know, you want to have your coffee, or you walk and buy the cornflake or the Pringles. You know, uh, last week I was in D.C. and I spoke at America, and I was like, you know, for the women, you know, you want to have a good lipstick, and I'm like, no, don't say that. American women are very offended when you start talking about lipstick. You know, I said, well, I'm sorry, it's a cultural issue. I'm from Africa, you know, we can say about that. But I need for women to understand clearly that if you walk and you use cosmetic and lipstick, you got to understand what is the ingredient in that lipstick. If someone is taking oil palm and is doing this, and I will show you what Ed is doing, and you feel good wearing that, you should understand clearly that another woman is paying the price and a very, very high price. So this is what is driving. And people who live in this area are poor. Yes, this is just a Liberian portion, but think about the globe. These are the areas that are now the areas where a lot of investment is moving towards. People want the land. They want the forest. They want the mineral below it. They want the oil and gas below it. They want the water. They want the timber. Everything. The poorest live here. But this is where they're extracting all of the investment. And unfortunately, even that investment <coughs> is not transforming everything. And you will see in this study how the development, and I put that in quotation, that is coming here, is not changing anything. They are poor, but they sit on top of wealth. Poor who want to have that wealth, or have added to that wealth, are not respecting them, and they are destroying their home because of that. And all because of what we want. What we desire. We want to live a good life. We want to be aware of this what it is. <clears throat> so it's driving that. Of course, there's also about food. Most of you know in the last decade, the food crisis, speculation, and everything around the world. Where do you have more food? And also, rich countries are going into place and buying land. You know, so you want food, you want fiber. These things were going on. And Africa became a major focus of that place. You won't imagine the amount of investment. Almost 25 trillion dollars all over the, you can see, all over the continent. You can even see in my little Liberia, what's more, that was going on, right? And so, they came in all the forms, oil, gas, mining, agriculture, forestry, infrastructure. And of course, the usual suspects, I'm sure you know some of them, there's Hasselometer, there's Chevron, there's Exxon, Elenito, China Union, Sam Dabi. Most of you are familiar with some of these. They just went. And you can imagine Liberia had just come from war. 15 years of a terrible war. The infrastructure completely destroyed. The education system is destroyed. All of a sudden, there's $18 billion in foreign direct investment somewhat forced into the country with no absorptive capacity to even manage that. They're just trying to build a government from scratch. And all of a sudden, these people have an interest in bringing investment. Huge amount of investment. With no capacity. Oh, we want to create jobs. But we don't have the engineers. We don't have the geologists. We don't have the agriculturists. We don't have the agronomists. We don't have all of these things. So what kind of job are you going to create for us to take all these resources? There were issues there. And so I just want to show you, you know, because part of what is taking two, because there are many, I guess I'm taking two of these constructions, you know, to, to just show you what it is. So this is one, for example, Sam Davy. Sam Davy is the largest oil palm, both upstream and downstream. And sometimes you don't see Sam Davy. But Sam Davy is probably in your Prexville or in your Pringles or in your bottle of soap or in your lipstick. 
You will see a written stamp there, but that's already it is. Or maybe it's in your pizza. You know, but you don't see it. It's not written stamp daddy, but it's the product. So, you know, the supply to Nestle, and Nestle, of course, you know what it is. So, 63 years, 313,000 hectares in five regions of Liberia. You know, and a hectare is a data in 50 cents. And they say that is undeveloped. And so what I describe as undeveloped, and I went back to you, and I just gave me some time before. So this is undeveloped. This is what undeveloped is. This is not development. If the home, if other things are talking about, it's not development. So they gave a dollar and 50 cents for that area. But they gave 2 dollars and 50 cents, I should have had the other slides, so where they put the oil palm. So clearly they, they define what development really is. So even if the locals had their own food crop, their rice, their streams, their creeks, it's not development. So once they put oil palm, it's development. And it was an issue. Right? So the locals decided to resist that and said, no, we're going to accept this in the land for us. The company had gone and negotiated only with the government. And not the communities. There were no consultation, nothing. So they went in. The locals said, no, we don't accept this. And so they complained and came to us. And there's been an issue about really the rights to land. And, it, and the, the indigenous people said, you know, who lived on this land before even the front of Liberia? Imagine the first flag. Free slaves left the United States, found Liberia, but they also met indigenous people who were already there, who had their own way of government and system and everything. All of that stuff now absorbed the land. In fact, when they arrived, this is the map they did. This is the map of the 18 titles. Where they said, you know, we come here, we negotiated on you gun boat, we've got a few areas here, yeah, our territory. We recognize you have uh, the, the rulers of the land. And that is even further described here. And this is important. And so if you see here, because we now begin sovereignty, that okay, we extinguish everything. So you can see where they awarded concessions. This is a concession map. But inside the concessions are villages. And all these areas are now controlled by the corporations. We're able to do stuff to see what it is. So they were not even careful to even find a way to get these people out. And the locals knew what to do with their land. You know, if you went to every town and village, it would tell you clearly, yes, what boundary, how we use our land, other things we do about that. We were able to say all of those things. And of course, with improvement of technology, we're trying to find a way to also educate men and women to be able to mark the land, do stuff. And so they resisted. They resisted that. Because you won't believe what was going on. Crop, sacred sites, burial ground, graveyard, pollution, marginalization, threat, harassment, all kinds of stuff. They were using the instrument of the government to suppress the people. I mean, you can describe it. It was huge. I remember the first time when uh, my staff came and said, you know, we have to go out there and see what was And I went out to the society that day. And we got up the vehicle. First when I looked, it was my first time seeing as far as the eyes to see to the horizon. Because what has happened was, remember, oil palm is something that is done in Southeast Asia. The Malaysian and Indonesian have big oil palm stuff. So they took that culture in Southeast Asia and tried to supplant it in West Africa. There are different tenure issues. There are different land use, land planning issues. There are different cultural issues. They were not prepared to even understand that. As far as they were concerned, they wanted cheap land. They wanted a government that would give them that cheap land, and they failed to claim it. Then Dabi had imported almost 250 yellow missions to clear the forest. As shown earlier, the, the agreement covers like five regions. Liberia is divided into administrative structures called counties, right? Called counties, almost like where you have the federal, but it's counties. So five of those counties were covered by the concession in all the forest areas. If you show the map, I show the map of Liberia, the upper end was all tropical forest. They planned to clear that area. And in fact, that day they were lined up. The locals had complained that, in fact, they thought that the war was coming to an end because some of them said they were in their villages and they just saw like 10 yellow machines or 50 machines lined up and just moving. And they just saw everything dropping. They had not seen that before. It was a cultural shock to all of a sudden see all of that massive 
machines and technology moving and dropping everything. You know, and I always say we have not even started to look at that part of the impact. The psychological and the emotional impact of land grabbing. Because I have seen farmers who spend their lives four or five generations doing subsistence farming and all of a sudden we get up in the morning with their tools and they will put their tools down and they will sit down and we just gaze into the horizon. They will just gaze and just gaze and then gaze. And some of them have just started to die off. You don't understand this. You know? And this is what some of the stuff will look like. And you know they gave them all kinds of names. So in an area, for example, they call it in the Bible. And you see what they call it, it tend, tend to be the Bible, what they were doing. They would go to a village, thousands of years, and they just clean around the entire place. And normally in traditional areas, we use the forest, I told you, it's home, it's everything, it's even for privacy. So you walk out of your home, and you come up, and it's all clear. And this is it. And you just clear that. And of course, I talk about development. So even areas where people had their crops, they say, oh, we'll compensate you. So we did some analysis in some of the areas. So yeah, for example, people had an orange tree. Orange, that little people grow. Because you see, uh, in society like the U.S., you have your social security. So you pay on and you get old and you can live off that. In these villages, they have their own system of social security. So they invest into cash crops. Every time they plant, like, you know, maybe few trees until they get older, they have an option. When they are unable to do the physical work, they rely on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Is this crop, the company and I come and say, no, we don't need your orange tree. We want to put the oil palm. So we'll clear it and we'll compensate you. So look at the orange tree. They pay six dollars for a tree. But annually, if you it, an orange tree will produce something like 7 to 12 bags of oranges annually. A bag is between 10 to 10, uh, 7 to 10 dollars. They don't even put in the market value. They don't even put in the economic value. It's 10 dollars. So what development is this? You bring in oil palm. You say you want to improve the lives of people. You want to give them jobs. They already have income generating activities. You're not adding value to that. You move that and you are not paid. So you are further impoverizing them. You're not, there's no way I can see how that is really development. So if you go back to how much they even pay for the land, it's a dollar and 25 cents a hectare. Now, these people are getting seven, uh, $10 for a bag. They could afford to pay that. They could afford to pay more than that for a hectare. So just from one tree, they can get seven bags of average and they can afford to pay even that. Even the sellers, okay, we want you to pay. Right? So there's something wrong with the whole, I want you to understand where we're heading with this, is the model of development. The business model is the problem. Is the problem. The business and economic model we see is the problem. And we'll get that. Let me explain an example. You know, in this area, for example, the, the chief who lived here said, you know, you have to kill me for it. They broke down all of his people. They drove them. He was in the house. They tried to break it apart, and he, this is, he said, I'm not going to leave. So he stayed in the home, and his people would bring him food. But you can even see, right? You see oil palm in his backyard. You can see it. Everything is clear. Fields all over the place. Of course, I'll tell you about the water. And then they say the jobs. The jobs that give the food, nothing less than these are women, you know, who now, and this is what is important. Some people don't see that. Those who are the worst victims, the worst abuse, I have seen that are the women. They suffer the most. The most. Giving our customer system. You don't imagine what they go through. I've seen women, because now they destroy their land, they can't even make their guardians. They can't go to the creek and collect their fees. They are forced to work for the company. They have their children. Women who are breastfeeding, breastfeeding mothers. They get up 2 30, 3 a.m. in the morning and they have to walk two hours to be able to get on the tractor because they need to earn an income. Their husbands are frustrated and they try to move somewhere else. Where are you going to carry four or five babies? 
And especially if you're in a polygamous relationship, where your husband has custody or otherwise, he's gone. And this only a level of the kids. They have to struggle for themselves. They become scavengers. I have seen women struggling to find a way to feed their kids. They leave their kids lying down, give them breast milk, and rush out and walk hours and jump on a tractor and spend all days in their happy peace. And even in the areas where they have, the company will come and like, oh, we have the concession and so, you know, no trespass. I've had cases where I have to go to court. And it's criminal trespass to park on your own land. You saw the plantation, I'll show you the map, the, GA, the, G, the, the GPA, GIS map, where these villages are tied into the concession. And you walk outside and like, it's trespass. And they use the criminal law to try to sanction them. Here for court, I slap suit. But here they use the state apparatus to separate these people. And of course, I tell you about the burial grounds. Even the dead were not spared. They put palms all in graveyards and burial areas where you have to document that. Water became a serious issue, a crisis. Because the stream, you know, it wasn't an area I've seen where people use engineering to really abuse rice. Re engineer the stream flow. The water will flow into the communities. The palm oil will re engineer the flow outside of the village into the palm farm. You know. So that's why, you know, when I said, I always say this. I say, you don't need the guns to kill people. You don't need guns. If you went to a place, you dropped the land, you destroyed the crop, you destroyed the farmland, you polluted the river, you desecrated the sacred sites, you offered the livelihood, you destroyed the culture and the history and the value and the belief system of people. No one has to tell you that you are killing people, that you are ethnically cleansing people from out of their land. And that's why I believe that men grabbing is a war crime. <clears throat> so even at that, so we started off, complaints presented to the government. Of course, you know, like I always say, you know, when I travel, I always say that. I take my passport. <clears throat> you know, we complained to the government. We did that. We complain to the government, like, you know, this is going on, local level. And we won't listen. Why? Because the corporations have captured the state. They captured by the state. They kill captives by the state. And sometimes you believe you're from, I'm, I'm a citizen of the Republic of Liberia from the sovereign. No. I'm not a citizen from San Dabi or a citizen from Exxon Mobil or from Chevron. That's why a lot of us across the world are, and we really believe that we are citizens of the country, no, because the real decisions about this country have been made by corporation. So even if you complain, they won't listen to those complaints. So we just carry a passport already. We know who makes the decision. So we're able to take this, because the oil palm corporation were part of our, uh, a scheme called the Round Table of Sustainable Palm Oil. How many of you are aware of the RSPO? The round table for sustainable palm oil, you know, it's a trade level process where they have, they have a certification scheme where you abide by certain standards and criteria set up by that scheme. And they have a complaint mechanism within the round table. And so we'll file a complaint through that. Because no one listens to us, not even the government. And so the, the RISP will respond that, send the team to verify the complaint. Say, yes, you guys were right, the complaint is valid, it's material. And so the companies stop, halt. You have to negotiate with the communities. You have to obtain their free prior informed consent. And you know why? You know, you sign up that there will be no deforestation. So you can't do that. Let me sure you have things very right. And that begins the problem. So even the government that was not listening, this is our president, this is the town hall meeting, he finally went in. He said, oh, you know, I thought we'll stop it now. We use an international mechanism to stop it and say, hold on, let's have a conversation. So she's not going, oh, you know, the president, I'm elected, you know, when we sign an agreement to bring investment for you, you have no right to question those investments. So, in fact, there is uh, an, uh, an op ed in the, in the New York Times at the time, written by a friend of mine who said, she had just gotten a Nobel Prize. And they said, a Nobel laureate problem. You know, how do you bring investment or development and the people cannot participate, can ask questions? 
you know. I was at this meeting and I was threatened at this very meeting by the president. There's a photo, but I don't like to show that. You know, that the, the, the media photo. She called me and threatened me and said, like, you know, you are trying to cause problems for this country. And they just pray, you know. And the problem was not solved. And so, you know, as we're negotiating, the government was not trying to allow the communists to really work with the communities. And say so one area, for example, in 2005, there was a protest. It became violent. You know, the, the youth wanted to talk to the managers and the government and the companies. They didn't want that to happen. So the protest went violent. There was some destruction. The police went in. The people, the company, private security, collided, you know, collaborated with the police, arrested people, broke into people's homes, who were arrested. And then, you know, this is those of you who are involved in this camp. So first I was accused of inciting the violence. I had not even gone in for a year. But the part of the story I didn't talk about is what uh, my friend who introduced me alluded to. You know, we had gone there 2014 when we filed a complaint. And the round table said, we're going to come and do verification. So while we were in the field trying to verify that the company was indeed in violation of the RIC or principles and criteria, the company, private security, put in 150, you know, tried to stop the mission and then put up roadblocks and surrounded our vehicles. I'm like, you know, we're going to kill you, Mr. Brunel. You're not going to come here with your people from Green Advocate and say you're going to fire company to this company. You're not going to go alive. And so they surrounded my vehicle. They put a roadblock. When they identify who I was, they say, what is the lawyer so yes in? They have got in their prey. They build a bonfire. They just warlike. They have machetes. They were trying to bust into my car and split the tires. They were dancing. And there were alcohol all over the place. They were drinking in the super. They were performing their final rituals now to come and get me. You know, they made claims of cutting my head off, opening my heart. You know, someone said, your, your score will be, you know, used by my boss. It was a terrible stuff. I hate to talk about that because it's very emotional. Every time I have to go through that, it reminds me of what happened that day. You know, but a local chief, you know, I was praying for it, but a local chief came and said, you know, this blood will not waste on this land. I'm a chief. You want to kill him? Really? Take him to another village. But I cannot allow this. And a young man, positive for us, he shot at the chief. Hit the chief. And the young people said, No, why are you hit our chief? So the young people in the village and the company security started the conflict. The chief said, Okay, then I'm going to remove the roadblock. I think. That's why I'm standing here today. You see me. It was 150 men armed, and they didn't hide it. They were wearing the company coat, the boots. They had tools from the seal. In fact, one of the managers were even trying to come right now. He said, oh, "Stop this! I'm going to dismiss." He said, "We don't care. We don't take instructions from you. You can't dismiss us." It was very clear. It was a terrible moment. And after that, in 2016. They tried to get me to work for the government. I said no, and they issued a rape to have me arrested. They said they yeah, issued a subpoena, which was never served on me. They went and got uh, a contempt order to have me arrested. Instead of coming to me a contempt order when the judge was in the court, they waited when the judge was gone around. They put their clothes. They got against us. People who were under the influence of alcohol. I gave them a and said, go to Mr. Brownell's office. He's going to be there. Again, Maybe by act of God and nature, I was not at that office that particular time. I had gone to a funeral. They entered the office, they threatened my colleagues, tried to beat them up. When they did not find me, they tried to nail hunt for me. The following day, a certain rate was issued. This time, it was not just for me. We had 15 staff working as an advocate. They want everyone else to live it. I'm going to arrest everyone. When they couldn't find me, they went to my house, they bust into my home, they arrested my uncle. Then the third day, they issued a terror raid. Search and seizure for the entire staff, anywhere what it is. Then they went to the police and the military, and they had people signing on. All the police commanders across the country were issued flyers to check. And so friends, you know, were very helpful and allowed me to get out of the country. 
when they launched the, the, the petition online, you know, different groups were trying to draw the attention of the government. They said, why you do this? Why you saying this? No, no, no. That's not really true. You know, we are not after him. In fact, they went back from the meeting and said, oh, no, this is a brand new trick. It's not true. We're not after him. It's false alarm. But the reason for all that, severe solid red issue. My uncle was arrested. Uh, all of the Green African staff were included into the raid. Office was shut down. You know, and so that's why I'm here today. But you see, um, <clears throat> the things I said, you know, then grab could cause conflict. And sometimes the conflict we're talking about may not just be in a small area we call Liberia. There could be ripple ripple effect beyond that. And so that's why this high start is just drip, drip, trickle, trickle. You know, a small conflict in a village, start, people are displaced, they have to move. From the village in the urban area, the moving slum and smaller communities. And everyone will look at it because it's not in your backyard, right? And then you see this. You see this across the globe. And people are alarmed. <clears throat> people are alarmed. You see, people are alarmed, right? So, well, why is people crossing the place? And of course, then you see this in your own backyard. And people are now wondering that when you cut that forest, those were tons and tons of carbon that have been emitted into the atmosphere. And it will have an influence. People will be displaced, they will move, and they will affect the climate, and you will see this. Of course, there are some concerns, whether it is fake, whether the science is true, or the science is not true. But we are seeing it, and people are responding and reacting. And sometimes, you know, I'm sitting down here in amazement because what I already see is that people are responding to the signs and symptoms. It's a then it response. And like I said earlier on, we're not looking at the fundamental cause of what this is. It's an economic an investment in the financial business model that is starting to see here. So you respond to this or you respond to this that started in drip, in drip, drip, drip. We're not getting there. Right? And we say, well, like we're saying, yeah, let's do this. But even if you did this, if you did this, you may not be able to stop this or even this. We all have responsibilities. We all do have responsibilities, I said earlier on. We all do have responsibilities to be responsible consumers, to be responsible users of what we see in the environment, to ask questions. If you walk in the store, you buy a soap, ask questions where it's from. If you ride in a vehicle, it's a tire, ask questions where it's coming from. Things you are consuming, ask questions to make sure that it is sold in a very responsible way. You can see in a small place like Liberia, how this will evolve to where we now have. And much more than just what we're seeing, some of the things that are going on. I mean, the xenophobia, the hate, the embarrassment that is causing people. You don't want to see that going. People want to be happy, they want to be free. We are at a point where, because of some of the things that happen in other parts of the world that were overlooked, are not even tearing apart families who don't agree on these things. That's why I said earlier on. We are in this boat together. We must all work together. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I was wondering about um, what kind of solutions, despite all of the challenges, it sounds like there have also been a lot of um, solutions and, and amazing work that's been done in Liberia. And I was wondering, you know, has all of the land been grabbed? I was wondering, like, who the 
So the land is being purchased from by these corporations. If you've been able to make maybe like land trust <coughs> or kind of what legal, uh, have you been able to change the legal system at the maybe the county level or even the federal level? And if you have any allies that you've been able to find in the federal government despite all of them not allies. <laughs> so um, I'm sorry, maybe I, I, I put up a very terrible picture of what this is. There's been a lot of progress as well based on our campaign. We filed a complaint. We stopped, we stopped the grabbing of the land. We forced the corporations, for example. The two companies were able to make policy changes within our corporate structure. So, for example, they, they revised their standard operating procedure and put in the place provisions that allow them to obtain free prior informed consent of communities. So now every single company, you know, doing the oil palm has agreed free prior informed consent is central. If communities say no, it's no. They've also made institutional changes. So they included new departments of social or community consultation and environment is in different states. They, they train their staff to respond to that. So we achieved that. Uh, in fact, Sam Daddy and GVO and the others, the amount of land was almost like six to seven million acres of land because of the campaign we launched. You won't believe this. Sam Daddy's the manager only declared 10,000, 10,000 hectares. Right? Golden Vernon only declared 50,000 hectares. The government doesn't have to respond. To policy changes, there was a land policy which we were part of, land rights act which we were part of, that we have to put into place. So for the first time now, customary land rights are then elevated to the same status of private property rights. And that is before our parliament. There are some issues about that in the last few weeks which I've been trying to fight, but there's not a bill to be able to protect customary land property rights and ensure the free, private, informed consent of communities. But that's just what the issue is. So as we are having that negotiation, the bill is before the parliament, these companies are making these changes. They have commitment to their institutional investors, to their shareholders, to their financials. So imagine since 2010, you have made a commitment that you declared 3 million or 6 million acres of forest land put in oil palm. And seven years later, you are stuck with 10,000 and you have stranded assets. So you can see why. I had to leave. The people are not happy. They're like, oh, you know, we've got the complaints. I'm like, no, 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 the problems are not solved yet. And it created a lot of tension because of this. The complaints to the government and everyone, so I became that person, like, you know, you have to sacrifice, you have to get out. You know, we are not getting the land. So, yes, there's a lot of trained assets out there. They have not gone ahead. So, there has been improvement. And that's why we have to keep putting more pressure. And part of why I'm explaining this to you when I say being a responsible consumer is asking those questions. Because even here, you may not see Sam Dabi or Gordon Ferrolium or maybe Astrolab Metal, but you could use something that is from their product to their supply chain. You could be asking Netflix, for example, which buy a lot of these oil palm products. So make sure that you buy for Sam Dabi. Or maybe your university top, they have endowment. Are you invested into oil palm? Are you invested into oil palm? Are you incurring deforestation? Are you displacing children and women through your endowment investment into this? That's what the pressure points are. That's the leverage points are. Part of why I'm doing this, when you say I come, I'm like, yes! You know, it's my second time here this week. I was here talking to a class, you know. It's my second time this week. I'm happy to come because we want to share. But this is, it's for all of us. So yeah, there's been some progress. We can do more. Just wanted to ask, what do you think your next year? Uh, you're here in the U.S. for a year. What, what do you think you will? What are you thinking about for next year? Should we be trying to get you find you post So, elsewhere? Um, um, there are some security issues about that. So, what I'll do next year? Maybe when we close this, I will talk about what I'm planning for next year. Because you know, I have there are security issues surrounding my coming here, so I will not do my plans for next year. But I would certainly will stop the recording. I can share that with you. <laughs> well, thank you again.
again. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions you might have um, up here in the front. Thank you. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Drew.